Hello, we are Nerds of the West, and today we are teaching you how to play Gugong. This is a semi-worker placement, semi-resource management, hand management game. We the people that are going to be teaching you. My name's Tom, we have Chris. Hi. We have a Lachlan. Howdy. And we have a Sean. Hello. Sean, can you give us an overview of what this game is and how we win? Yep. So, overview of Gugong is a worker placement game in the sense that you have a hand of gift cards. And what you do is you'll be placing out your gift cards onto the board in the various spaces to do various actions. And those actions will allow you to gain points as depicted by around the board. Uh, at the end of the game, you have one sort of final end game scoring and then the person with the most points wins. Now, there is one other small caveat. You have this central area to the board. This is the Palace of Heavenly Purity. You want to make sure that you get your envoy to the very top because if you don't, you will score zero. You will lose the That's game. <laughs> so to get those points and to get your Heavenly Envoy up, you are going to be going around the table, taking one action at a time with each person replacing a gift card on the table with one from their hand. When you replace a gift card on the table, you take the one that is on the table and put it into your discard pile. And that will be important later on, mostly because that becomes your hand for the next round. Now, when you are replacing a card on the table, you want to be able to replace it with a card that is higher than what is there. So a one can be replaced by anything. Uh, and there is one small restriction that a nine can only be beaten by a one. When you replace a card with one that is higher, you will get to do the action both on your card and the action of the place that you replace a gift card freely. So if you replace the one with the six, you will get to do the boat action that is at the bottom of the six, and then the action of whatever place that you have replaced your gift card at. Most places will have two choices for you to choose, and you will get to do whichever one you prefer. And if you do not beat the number, you have three choices for what you can do. You can either pay two of your servants, to be able to still take the action. You can discard one of the cards in your hand to be able to still take the action, or you do not get to take the action. Now that is a choice because when you have a card in your hand, you have to play it. Um, that is important because that way you will replace cards in your discard pile with the cards on the board and everyone will go around the table until they are no longer able to take any actions because they have no cards left in their hand. Sean, what happens once everyone has taken their actions? Uh, so once everybody has taken their, all their actions, you will pass. And once everybody at the table has passed, we move from the day phase into the night phase. Now, the night phase uh, gains you some more servants. Now, servants are an important part of the game because you're going to be using them to be able to perform actions. We'll show you more of that when we get to the action spaces on the board. Uh, then. Every player in the night phase will pick up their cards they gathered from the previous round and they will match the numbers up with the numbers on the destiny dice. Now, if for instance, I had a six, two and a seven, I will have three matches, which means that I gain three servants, which will then carry over into the next round and allow me to do more things. And if I have the max amount of matches out of everybody else at the table, I will gain three victory points and I will get to move my envoy up one space on the palace track. Uh, the last step in the night phase is to advance the boats down the Grand Canal. Uh, if any boats fall off, which we'll explain more in detail, they are lost and you'll just get them back to your pool. At the end of the night phase, you might be able to guess that the morning phase happens because that is how the passage of time works. At the start of the morning phase, whoever has received the start player marker will get the start player token. They will be the first player for the next round. You will replace any tokens that have disappeared from the travel and exploration area. Um, you do not replace any that there is a person's marker on. You will re-roll the destiny dice so that people know what number of cards they are aiming for in this next round. You will activate any decrees that people have acquired throughout the game that have the morning space symbol. And then depending on what round you're in, you will gain a number of servants automatically. So in the first round, you will gain six servants and every subsequent round, you will gain only four servants. So that is how a game and a round will work. But to really get to play, you need to know what each of the spaces on the board are doing. So Sean, what is the first space that we need to know? Yeah, so let's look at the intrigue area. So if you place your gift card and exchange it with the one in the intrigue area, you can choose to do 
one of two actions. So there's typically a A action or a B action. The A action is a little bit cheaper. The B action is a little bit more expensive as you'll see as we go around to the other areas of the board. But the A action for the intrigue area is you get to move your intrigue token one space. I am blue, I'm gonna do that. You get to move your intrigue token one space and you get to take the first player silver medal. Now, that is important as Tom mentioned that during the morning phase, if I have this because I did that before anybody else, I will then get the first player token for the next round. The B action for intrigue is you get to spend one of your servants and you get to move your intrigue marker three spaces instead of one as per the A action. The second space that you need to know is the Great Wall. And at the Great Wall, you can either do the A action to place one servant out onto the wall, or you can spend one servant back to your general supply to place two servants out onto the wall. And the reason that you wanna do this is when it has reached the max level for the player count that you are playing at, in this case, we are playing with four, so when it hits the level four, the person with the most workers there will get a bonus and everyone else's workers will stay on the wall while the main person's workers will go back to their supply. Uh, the bonus that you get is three instant victory points and your envoy will move up one space. And there is a secondary bonus that is applied to everyone who is on the wall at the time that that happens, is that you can spend your intrigue to get resources. You can spend one intrigue point to get a worker you can spend three intrigue points to get two workers, five intrigue points to set a destiny dice to any face of your choice, and seven intrigue points for one jade. It is important to note that you might not want to do that because the intrigue track is the tiebreaker for everything, whether that is the final scoring or the person with the most destiny dice, intrigue track is your all time tiebreaker. Next up, we have the traveling and the adventure area. Uh, when you perform this action, what you're essentially going to be doing the first time you ever choose to do so is to deploy your lovely horseman uh, token on any of the spaces that you like. And when you do, you take that token, let's say for example, it was this one, uh, you take it, you perform the actions that are indicated on the front. Uh, you can check the rule book for any uh, long rundown of what each of them does. And then you deploy it into your tableau uh, in one of these six available spaces near the top uh, for use later on. Every subsequent time you adventure <laughs> in the traveling area, you're allowed to move your horseman token uh, one space, or if you take the B action, you can spend extra um, servants to move more than one space, hopping over empty spaces and over other players' horsemen tokens. And once again, you're following lines that are connected to one another so that you can gain the benefits of the tokens uh, that you land on. And the last thing to note with these tokens is that when you stack two or three or even six of them up uh, at the top of your tableau, at any time on your turn, you can spend as many of them uh, as indicated here, so either two, four or six, to gain the benefits instantly. And that doesn't actually count as your action on the turn, so that's a bonus uh, in addition to what you were choosing to do. That brings us on to the Dra Jade Palace, which you spend when you go to the space. Uh, the number of servants equal to the space where you want to take the Jade from. So you can spend two to take a Jade out of this uh, house, which then leaves one left. So then once that one's cleared by another player, then we move up to the three, four, and so on. Once all of these have been cleared, then you can always take a Jade from the supply here for five, uh, and they're always available until these fully run out, which I don't think will ever happen. And now we're on to the decree section. It allows you to select one of the decrees to be able to utilize throughout the game. Now these are randomized at the start of every game, so they're drawn out of a stack. Uh, we've got a few here. I'm not going to go into the specifics. You can check the rule books for those or watch our playthrough to see what these ones do. You pay whatever the cost of the decree is. So these ones are worth one. These ones here are worth two. And the more expensive ones are three. So you would be discarding that many servants out of your servant pool. Now, it is also important to note if any other player is already on that decree because it costs you an extra servant in addition, however many other players are there. So in this case, there is two. So it would cost me one to do to go to this decree and then two extra servants to pay the cost because there's two other players there. And then I also need to pay one additional servant to put there to say I have actioned that decree. So it's gonna cost me four servants all up. 
Down the bottom of the board, we have the Grand Canal. And when you visit the Grand Canal, you have, once again, the two choices. The first choice is to take one servant and put him on a little boat at the first space and then move your boat to the next available space. So if someone else's boat is already on a space, you then skip over them and move to the next available space. Uh, the second option is to pay one servant to place two servants out. And the reason that you wanna do that is because boats don't do anything for you until they are full and you have three servants on there. At that point, you can pop that boat, you can take your three servants back and you will get the bonus of the location that you are at. And there are three bonuses that you can get. There is straight four victory points. There is draw another card from the cards that are left over. And then subsequently you will have five cards for all future turns. Or you have your big, Thick fat boy worker. He is worth two people for any points of interest. So that means he is worth two people when putting out onto Great Wall. He is worth two points for paying the penalties for placing cards out. Uh, the only place that he cannot be put at all uh, is over into the decree section. You cannot do that to increase the cost for someone else. But in terms of taking him back from your bag, he is only one worker. So he is the same for you to get, but more for you to spend. It is worth noting that the final section on the Grand Canal, you can choose any of those three. However, each one can only be selected a certain number of times. Your big thick boy can be selected once, your card uh, action can be taken twice, and your four points can be taken three times. When you do take a boat, uh, you take two of your workers back into your supply and one worker slides into the slot that you have chosen to indicate that you have taken that. And that means there is three spaces up the top here for your worker to get those four points. And the last section on the board is the Grand Palace of, what was it? Um, Heavenly Purity. Heavenly Purity, thanks for that, Sean. Uh, the reason you would want to keep an eye on the Grand Palace of Heavenly Purity is that, as was explained, if you don't make it to see the Emperor by the end of the game, it doesn't matter how well you've done throughout the game, you score zero victory points and you are out of the running, so you must, must, must make it to the end. Any time that uh, a space or a card or any effect would instruct you to move your envoy up the tracker, you do so by one space or two spaces, however many are indicated. When you eventually do make it to the very top, you see there are five empty spaces here. Obviously, some of them are more valuable than others by the end of the game. So for example, the first player to make their envoy to see the Emperor is worth seven victory points by the end. And it's also worth noting that getting there as fast as you can is also a good idea because any further time you would be instructed to move your envoy up the tracker, you get an instant victory point uh, since you can't advance any further than the Grand Palace. When you place your card out to take the action in the Grand Palace, uh, one of two options. The first is the simple move your envoy uh, up the tracker by one space. And the B option is that you can spend two of your workers to advance your envoy as well as advancing an entry token, bolster your influence and win ties and such. So that is how all the actions work in Gugong. You'll be doing that over four rounds and once all four rounds rounds have ended, you will move on to final scoring. Uh, there are three phases to final scoring. First of all, you will do the Great Wall of China one final time, and whoever has the most on there, even if it is not finished, will get the bonus for that. You will then check all the decrees for any final scoring. Most likely these two up here will give you final scoring points. Uh, you will also check where everybody is for the Emperor and give them their final points for that and you will check Jade and Jade will score you in incremental values. One Jade gets you one point all the way up to five Jade getting you 15 points. It is on your player board for you to check. So any purple points are added at the end. Any red points that you see on the board are added throughout the game. You are aiming to get the most victory points that you can and show the Emperor that you are the best at giving gifts to everyone at these locations. If you are more of a visual learner, we're gonna play through this now because that's what we do here, twitch.tv slash nerds of the West. You can learn the game with us, play it along, and then we will review it at the end to tell you our thoughts. Thank you so much for watching. You can catch those videos on YouTube later and we will catch you next time.